Our first attempt to convince the Swedish church that he, they could use me as a geologist was to try and get them to send us to Bolivia to work in a gold mine um, for a mission. Um, that that uh, went down like a lead balloon, as you can imagine. <laughs> I was born in the colony of Northern Rhodesia, so I was born into the British Empire. When I was 10, we moved down to South Africa, which was then probably the, the gold mining capital of the world. And I suppose that was the reason I, I got into geology. I met my wife at university in, in Johannesburg. She, she was, was Swedish, and because of apartheid, we basically left the country uh, in 81. Uh, immigrated to Sweden. Around the time of our, our second uh, son's birth, uh, we both had a, a radical conversion. We landed up in the Pentecostal church, uh, mainly because they had child minding. The other churches we tried didn't have anything. Very shortly after that, we decided to commit our lives to, to mission work. And that was back in 83, 84. And since then, uh, we've lived now in a total of eight countries. And all that moving has been um, because we've tried to follow what we believe God is calling us to do. The fact that we were involved with social mission was basically because the Swedish International Development Agency had figured out that they were pumping millions and millions into development projects around the world uh, with uh, NGOs uh, and getting very little back but they figured out that if they put that money into mission organizations, churches, um, they were actually getting uh, a lot more for their money. I worked alongside those people who were doing more evangelistic work. I would work um, on providing water to schools, secondary schools that were built, um, clinics that were built in, in the communities in Burundi by the church. Unfortunately, our whole um, escapade in, in Burundi was brought uh, to sudden close because of the genocide in Rwanda, which had a knock-on effect uh, in Burundi, so a civil war broke out at the same time. We went back to Sweden, and then uh, since that uh, time I've basically worked in consulting uh, for environmental engineering companies or uh, hydrogeology companies. We basically ran a home church um, with other people who, who uh, had a similar sort of um, desire to, to have a smaller um, worship style and we carried that over into Spain as well. Along came the uh, financial crisis in 2008. Spain was hard hit, so my clientele basically just dried up. And I started looking for a job and found that uh, for some strange reason there were quite a few jobs in hydrogeology in, in Shrewsbury. We thought that because we had a, a fairly um, evangelical background, we'd probably find a home in an evangelical free church. And God used something very strange. My, my wife, Lissy, was out walking our, our dog one day and walked past this church with purple doors. And she loves the color purple. And she said, oh, that's a church we must go to. And that was how we got into St. George's, because they had purple doors, which were shut. <laughs> but God uses the most amazing things. We just had such an incredible experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Eucharist. Week after week after week, Sunday after Sunday, it was actually quite remarkable. No different to what we'd experienced in the Pentecostal church, just the same presence of God. After a year or two, I, I felt a calling to start looking into ministry. Um, I waited a few years because I felt, well, I know nothing about the Church of England. I know nothing about Anglicanism, actually. I grew up as a Roman Catholic. Um, I've been through the Pentecostal church and now I'm in the on the middle way in the Church of England, which encompasses both ends, which to me is, is really good because I think the Church of England uh, and Anglicanism has this goal of seeing the disunity in the body of Christ as the problem and working really hard to bring unity. It goes back to, I think, a, a principle, you know, growing up as an African, third generation African, um, the principle of Indaba. They would sit and they would discuss an issue in, in a setting similar to this until everybody reached agreement. The scary part is being willing to say yes, to, to say, okay, God, this doesn't make any sense, because a lot of the time it really hasn't made any sense at all. Sometimes it, that's all that we've been able to do is, is say, God, we don't see this, but if it is you, please open the doors, and, and lo and behold, things have happened to, to, to lead us in the direction that we've gone in.